The first law that God ever gave was a command to fast. In the garden, when creation was new and functioning exactly like it was supposed to function, and the man and woman were simply made in the image of God and had not yet gone herring after the image of the devil. There was no need to tell them not to kill each other, not to steal or lie to each other, not to betray husband or wife, not to worship the creation instead of the creator. Truly good creatures have no desire to do any of those things. But God still gave them a law. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. No need for two tables of stone for that. Maybe a stone notepad. The one commandments, we could call it. It was a fast. And not even the extreme kind we encounter in our gospel reading where the faster abstains from all food. It was more like a standard Lenten fast where you abstain from one food or one kind of food. Adam and Eve were welcome to eat anything else, just not the fruit of that one tree. Another way in which this first fast was like a Lenten fast is that the thing Adam and Eve were supposed to abstain from was not in itself an evil thing. Creation was unfallen as of yet. God had made it and declared it, along with everything else, to be very good. And since it was just a tree, it didn't have a free will that it could abuse to make itself evil, the way the devil and his angels had done back when they were Lucifer and God's angels, and the way Adam and Eve were soon to do. If God had allowed them the fruit, it would have been good, like everything else, just like the things we give up for Lent are actually good or at least are supposed to be. 15 years ago, already, there was a movie, a romantic comedy, unfortunately, about a guy who gives up sex for Lent. But the guy in the movie isn't married. So he's giving up something that God has not actually given him in the first place. What he was doing was giving up a sin for Lent with the full expectation that as soon as Lent was over, he was going to dive right back into it. That's not what Lent is about. It's not you agreeing to obey God for 40 days so that he'll leave you to your own devices the rest of the year. The struggle against sin must be waged at all times. Nor is Lent the time when you repent for things, because repentance is necessary year-round too. The point of Lent is 40 days with a special emphasis on penitence. And the point of the fast is to deprive yourself of something good, a good gift of God that you normally consume heedlessly without proper thanks and praise to him, as if it were your own and gotten by your own strength and not a gift of divine goodness. And at the same time, to teach your body to feel sorrow over sin and not just your mind, because purely mental contrition can be a very shallow theoretical thing. The mind feels sorrow more keenly and is more likely to dwell on what it has done wrong when the body is sad too. So Adam and Eve had been commanded to perform something like a Lenten fast, to abstain from one thing in particular and that a good thing. But the purpose was different, for Adam and Eve had no sins as of yet, nothing to feel regret over, nothing to repent for. The Bible doesn't actually tell us in so many words why God gave this commandment concerning the tree. It was probably in order that Adam and Eve might learn to be good by the exercise of their own free wills instead of by dint of their original programming, so to speak. It gave them a chance to worship God freely by obeying him in this one command, even if they didn't understand why. And of course, the fact that God did command it, whatever his reasons, is another thing that distinguishes this first fast from what we do during Lent. Because there is no divine law to fast during Lent. That's why the Lutheran Church recommends it only and does not require it of our members. But in Eden, there was a divine law for Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This was, in fact, the only divine law. It was the whole law. It was 
eminently doable. With no sinful nature to fight against, no evil tradition inherited from their ancestors or learned from their fellow citizens, not being tempted by the lusts that sport with us so easily, the only requirement being to fast from one particular food. We are at a loss to explain how it came to pass that our first parents dropped the ball. Most of what we know about it comes from our Old Testament reading for today and from St. Paul's commentary on that passage in our epistle reading for today. And neither text explains the inner workings of how it happened. Yes, we see Satan in the serpent planting seeds of doubt with mild-mannered but poisonous questions. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? No, Eve assures him. And we see that she is too innocent to suspect that she's dealing with anything but an honest mistake on the part of the snake. We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And we observe, because we do know about good and evil from the millennia-long school of hard knocks, that even though our first mother has answered well, the tempter has still gotten away unrebuked with the insinuation that God has commanded something unreasonable. Did God actually say? And then when Satan turns to direct contradiction of the divine words, you will not surely die, and leaps from that to accusing God of selfish motives in the prohibition. What will really happen if you eat is that your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil, and God knows it. When he does that, why does Eve keep listening? Why doesn't she take offense on God's behalf and tell the serpent to go swallow its own tail? Why does she allow the words of a creature newly met to undermine her trust in the one who made her and gave her everything she has? We just don't know. But it's fruitless to ask for any rational account of the beginning of evil, isn't it? Because evil is the most irrational thing in the universe. It's always contrary to what is good for the one who practices it. It always alienates from God, who is wisdom and strength and health and joy. And this is something that we poor heirs of this first sin have learned all too well. Though sometimes it fools us into thinking that we've gained something that God, that big killjoy, was spitefully withholding from us. The whole time, it's eating us up from within, hollowing us out like methamphetamine, which hooks users by lighting up the pleasure centers in their brain, but is at the same time burning out those very pleasure centers so that eventually they will not respond to real joys, but only to bigger and bigger chemical lies. This is what Eve began to discover when she took the fruit that God had not given her. And having eaten, the next thing she did was exactly what the devil had done to her, to multiply sin, to spread it, to find company for it. God might not understand, but Adam will. Good old Adam. It can be him and me against the world if it has to be. And we say to her, like people who interact out loud with their movies, how could you do that to him? But would she understand the question? Would she even try to understand the question? She's like us now, and we know how we are. We know the game sinners play with their own conscience. Do what to him? This fruit is great. And if there is some punishment coming my way, well, Adam's no better than I am. No reason he should be spared and not me. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. And he ate. And there's even less we can work with here to try to understand what was going on in his head when he took the plunge. Why did he do it? Did he not know? Did she innocently slip some forbidden fruit onto his plate that night and he went ahead and ate it in innocence thinking it was lawful fruit from somewhere else in the garden? No. 
because God held him just as guilty as her. And in our epistle, St. Paul says not only that he sinned, but that it was his sin, not Eve's, that spread sin and death to all later generations. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. Meaning, even over those whose sinning was less intentional, less aggravated than Adam's. Even over those who did not have an explicit law from God's own mouth, like Adam did. And who thus might be able to plead ignorance, unlike Adam. They still died, because by their own sinning, they participated in the willful transgression of their father Adam against the divine command. So why did he do it? Was it an act of solidarity with his wife? Did he not want her to face God's judgment alone? If so, it was the most destructive thing that anyone has ever done out of misguided love. Out of the kind of love that blows its horn and says, look, I'm love, I'm good, you can't say anything about me, that's bad. When all the while it's siding with some creature against God who is love and from whom all love flows. This is the kind of love that pits itself against God, that loves something or someone else so much that it results in hatred for God. And if this is what motivated Adam, he learned his lesson later on as he found out what it means to be a sinner. When he found himself trying to save his own skin by testifying against Eve, throwing her to God, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. So much for solidarity. You're a sinner now. True solidarity isn't something sinners do very well. If Adam had remained innocent and prayed and interceded for Eve, as Jesus would later do, and pray and intercede for his bride, the church, he might actually have helped her. Instead, he ended up betraying her. In the end, we don't know why Adam ate either. Same problem as before. Sin can be explained only by appealing to previously established sinfulness. Yes, it was a terrible, crazy, godless thing to do. But you know how sinners are. They're terrible and crazy and godless. But the first sin of an innocent creature who is not a sinner, who is just, who is made in God's image, you can't explain that as anything except some kind of psychotic break. Adam sinned. He chose to eat the fruit. He broke the fast, the most important fast ever. The fast that if it had been kept, no other fasting would ever have been necessary, for no one would ever have had to lament their sins and repent. The first man sinned, and with that, the whole human race was corrupted. Eve was bad. Adam was bad. There was nothing left but a bad root from which the rest of us could come. That is, until Jesus came. Our epistle reading concludes, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. There is a second man from whom the human race can descend. Jesus is the new root. With him the human race begins again. Since he was born of Mary, he is one of us. There's continuity. This new humanity is for us. It's not some unrelated strain of humanity from another planet. But since he was begotten of his father before all worlds, he also has the power to make all things new. And he built the bridge between the old and the new, between his brothers and sisters on his mother's side and the everlasting righteousness and bliss at his father's side by defeating the serpent that had felled Adam and Eve, by keeping the fast they had failed to keep. Today in our gospel reading, 
we remember when the devil armed himself once more against a father of men and once more intruded upon a fast that the Lord had commanded him. Jesus was in the wilderness fasting, remember, because the Holy Spirit had led him there. And when that fast was almost over and he was bodily at his weakest, the tempter came again and waved the prospect of bread beneath his famished nostrils and appealed again to his pride, not promising him this time that he could become like God, but acknowledging the likeness he already shared with God and urging him not to put up with this ignominious role of a suffering servant. How could you be hungry? Use your power, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And Jesus was not like Adam and Eve. Jesus stood like a bulwark, like a wall, behind whom his bride might safely shelter. A mighty fortress is our God. He triumphed where Adam and Eve had failed. Christ, the second Adam, came to bear our sin and woe and shame, to be our life, our light, our way, our only hope, our only stay. To teach us what it means that man lives not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And especially the word that says, I died for you. I took the blame and you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus, amen.